Nostalgia is rightly regarded as a constant threat in the accurate assessment of greatness in sporting performances and performers of the past, especially the rather distant past. A gulf of decades can impart a rosy glow to feats of long ago, making them seem more remarkable than they really were, particularly in the memories of those seeking to revive and revalidate the thrills of their own younger days. But some of us of fairly advanced age believe we can and do resist major distortions of perspective. And our determination to continue doing so is strengthened by recognition of another menace to the true judgment of former glories in sport, one just as damaging as nostalgia. That is the tendency among more youthful generations of watchers of football and many commentators on it to overworship the triumphs and triumphant figures of the here and now, to see them as raising the game to unprecedented standards of virtuosity. The trend is undoubtedly encouraged by the arrival on the scene of players as spellbindingly entertaining and productive as Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, or Lionel if you trace his naming to Lionel Richie. <laughs> of course, it's a simple and reassuring fact that no modern developments in football have seriously undermined the lasting status in the game's lore of the man whose company we are so sadly denied tonight. As we send heartfelt wishes for Pelé's swift restoration to full vigor, the depth of our disappointment at his enforced absence testifies to the vast edifice of admiration still intact around a career that reached its prime half a century ago. Perhaps the stamina of his fame was guaranteed by the nature of his emergence as indisputably the most spectacular prodigy football has known. To be such an immensely exciting and influential presence as a 17-year-old at the 1958 World Cup Finals in Sweden was an unmistakable harbinger of wonders to come, and celebrating them has been a global habit ever since. Any slight blurring of awareness of just how wonderful he was is no more than must be expected with the passing of time. Only fools squander regret over the inexorability of such diminishing of vividness. But what can be irksome is the evidence in too many quarters of a nudge to acclaim the present as, in every sense, the unchallengeable zenith of football's technical standards. The case is probably sustainable in relation to general levels of performance, helped as they are by considerably improved playing surfaces and the rapid advances in the facilities and expertise applied to the treatment of injuries, though the slowness in addressing the long-term effects of concussive experiences is a dark blot on that progress. Back on the question of standards, it is when assertions about the relentless evolution of football reach the point of assuming that the best players of today are intrinsically more accomplished than the giants of the past that I wince. Pelé may not suffer much from that glibness, but others do. For example, some people who should know better are ready to tell us that Messi has proved himself a footballer substantially superior to Diego Maradona. Now, Messi is one of the ultimate joys of the contemporary football lover's life, a genius whose artistry simultaneously stirs the blood and makes us smile with a mixture of awe and sheer pleasure. But Messi, like Ronaldo, is a magnificent forward and phenomenal goal scorer. On the field, Maradona was a maker of worlds, certainly a shaper of World Cups. Whatever may be said about his erratic personality, or for that matter, the hand of God, the skills that produced his impact on the Mexico finals of 1986 
remains scarcely believable. Could either Messi or Ronaldo have inspired and marshaled a national team as he did Argentina then? Could either of them have gone to Napoli and led that club to the only two Serie A titles it has won? Ronaldo and Messi must obviously be prominent in any rational pantheon of truly great players, but it would surely be unjustifiably bold to place them as high as Pelé and Maradona, who, in an assessment with meaning for nobody but myself, stand as an isolated pair on the topmost tier of my imaginary rankings. The astounding scope of their strikingly different demonstrations of brilliance links them in my mind as the two most gifted footballers of my lifetime. Yet, in recollection, even Diego does not galvanize my feelings as much as Pelé. No doubt part of the explanation is that he was the supreme figure in the finest team I've ever seen. Here again we encounter skepticism. Many who have watched Brazil's World Cup winners of 1970 on film have remarked that, they, that their play often looked slow. The truth is they were slow and measured when it suited them. Change of pace was one of their deadliest weapons. How electric was Jairzinho as he rampaged to half a dozen goals in the championship as a wide player? Was Pelé laborious or was Carlos Alberto on the surge? The notion is as laughable as the old nonsense about the Brazilians settling for a style played instinctively to the samba beat. Their understanding of the fundamental workings of the game was far too profound for that to be true. Within the relaxed rhythms of their best teams, there was always a calculated alertness to the most effective means of hurting the opposition. How could it be otherwise in 1970 when their main midfield creator and organizer was the marvelously shrewd, technically superb, and incidentally, reliably hard Roberto Gerson? I can't think of anybody better at the job. And the same goes for Claudio Aldo as the exemplar of a brilliant all-round footballer designated holding midfielder. With Tostal and Rivellino also in the cast, they could accommodate a suspect goalkeeper and the occasional failings of a backline defender and still be confident of overwhelming opponents with their attacking power. What power it was. There was plenty of deserved praise for the Spain team that won the World Cup in 2010 and the European Championship in 2012. But Spain lost a group match to Switzerland in South Africa and needed a penalty shootout to survive their Euro semi-final. Brazil had no such stutters in 1970. True, England might legitimately have caused one in that most remarkable of collisions in Guadalajara. But even the splendid Mr. Banks, as the leading hero of the day, is obliged to remember that Jefferson wasn't on the park. Brazil managed just one goal in that contest, but by the end of the tournament, they had scored 19 times in six matches. In 2010, Spain's goals total was eight in seven matches. The chasm in those numbers proclaims an array of potent components, but there can be no failure to recognize that the very incarnation of the glories of Brazilian football then and forever was and is Pelé. Since his teens, he has been the beacon of his nation's faith in its talent for the game, the talismanic embodiment of pride and unique capacities. It is one of the few compensations of my increasing decrepitude that I can summon with clarity dazzling first-hand images of him in peak action and recall sporadic, sometimes lengthy, conversations with him over the years, exchanges made more rewarding as his English expanded. The England World Cup of 1966 was a painful episode 
He struggled in a largely aging squad before being brutally fouled and forced to the sidelines as Brazil were ousted by Portugal. I prefer to remember observing him at close quarters in his homeland during preparations for the 1970 finals, once when allowed to sit in the dugout for a match with Argentina. He was nearing 30, but showed no erosion of his outrageous gifts, which meant he radiated practically every quality the ideal attacking player should possess. His control of the ball was mesmeric, even at the gallop, whereas other outstanding players concentrate on mastering it. For him, in his explosive dribbles, it seemed to be a living ally, dancing between and around his sprinting feet as if it chose to be there. A fraction under five foot eight, he was sturdily built, athletic and resilient, a tremendously forceful player. He saw or sensed everything that mattered on the field. His passing was varied, inventive and precise, and his finishing with either foot or with the headers his soaring leaps afforded him was violently decisive. Unless, of course, somebody as special as Gordon got in the way. He is convincingly credited with nearly 1,300 goals. And underpinning all his repertoire was a perfect attitude to his responsibilities. John Giles, who could play a bit himself, once told me that Pelé, that the Pelé characteristic he admired most was the innate humility of the fully committed team man. If his best option for the team was to, the, was to roll the ball six yards to a mate, that's what he always did, said John. Obviously, Giles added, if you needed a miracle, nobody was better able to deliver it. Of course, the genuineness of Pelé's humility never neutralized the romantic dimension in his approach to his abilities. It shone through his admitted craving to score a unique, unrepeatable goal, the kind he wanted enshrined as Pele's goal. He made three unforgettable attempts to achieve it in Mexico. What a marvel and dramatic enricher of our sporting lives he has been an igniter of wild enthusiasm throughout the world. Once in Bogota, when an instance of mistaken identity caused him to, to be ordered off, the Colombian crowd became so enraged at being deprived of the sight of him that they began setting fire to cushions and hurling them onto the pitch, the Colombians. To avoid a full-scale riot, Pelle was told to put his boots back on and return to the action. It was the referee who had to go. <laughs> but Edson Arantes do Nascimento, the mighty Pelé, will be cherished for more graceful, less inflammatory spectacles. If posterity is an honest witness, he will be seen as one of the very greatest, perhaps the greatest of footballers for as long as the game is played.